great. Thanks, Anna. Holy smokes, there was people like waiting at our door in a lineup, 30 of them. Welcome everyone. Faison, did you have a question? Faison, did you have a question? I did actually send you an email regarding the questions. Uh, have you guys received it? I just saw it. I can respond to your email afterwards if that's okay. Oh yeah, yeah, that's fine. That's completely fine. Okay. Right. Awesome. Thank you. All right. So welcome everybody. We're think we're gonna get started because we do have a, a full schedule today. Um, this is the first of our four series of essential skills for job seekers. So today we're gonna look at writing your way to the top, how to write an interview worthy cover letter and resume. So I'm Tara Topping and I am from Project Learning Tree Canada. And first, before we get started, I just wanted to go over a few logistics. Firstly, I wanted to let everyone know that this webinar is being recorded so that we can share this live um, with some others on our website after. Uh, in addition, we have more than 240 people registered for the webinar. And so everyone is on mute and you do not have video access. But there are ways for you to engage today. So as you can see on the screen, um, at the bottom you have the, the Q&A feature and at any point during the webinar, you're welcome to put some questions into there and we will address it at the very end. We've reserved 15 minutes for question and answer. Uh, in addition, if we will have some staff monitoring the chat function. And so at the bottom, if you put something into the chat function, like if you're having trouble with audio or you need something right away, let us know and we're happy to help you. And in addition, uh, at the very end during Q&A, if there was something that you wanted to bring up to the whole group or you wanted to ask your question in person, if you raise your hand, then we will be able to unmute you. Um, if there's nothing else, we'll keep going. Hi, so I'm, oh, sorry, go ahead. I'm passing it over to Maria, <laughs> who will be doing a territorial acknowledgement. Thanks, Tara. Hi, everyone. Um, I would like to begin by acknowledging that PLT Canada's office is located within the unceded territory of the Algonquin Nation. I would also like to acknowledge that we are joined by folks from across Canada that are each in their own territory of Indigenous Peoples of Canada. I encourage you to check out the resource in the chat box that I'm about to click, uh, where you can learn more about local Indigenous territories and languages. Thank you. Thanks, Maria. So we have lots of new folks uh, with us today that potentially have not experienced Project Learning Tree Canada. So I wanted to tell you a little bit more about us. So we are a nonprofit initiative of the Sustainable Forestry Initiative, and we envision a world that values and benefits from sustainably managed forests and the great outdoors. SFI is an independent nonprofit organization that works in standards, conservation, education, and community to achieve a vision of the world that values and benefits from sustainably managed forests. And specifically at Project Learning Tree Canada, um, we are, are committed to using that outdoors to engage youth in learning about the world around them, uh, in rural, indigenous, and urban communities, and advancing environmental literacy. Since 2018, we are super excited that we have placed more than 2,500 youth in green jobs across 12 provinces and territories. We have achieved gender balance in all of our placements, and we've engaged with more than 200 employers in the Sustainable Forestry Initiative Network and the 
Canadian Parks Council Network. Um, this summer, in addition, we will be placing 1,300 more youth in jobs. Uh, in addition to the job placements, we also offer a high quality mentorship program for youth and forest and conservation sector professionals. So some of you with us today actually are mentees in our current pilot program. And that's actually what spurred this webinar series was their interest in having some additional skills. We are launching our second phase of the program in October and registration for that will be open in August. We also have, with Project Learning Tree Canada, opportunities for youth to attend networking events and training workshops, and we have a wide variety of career development resources on our website. Um, it is now my pleasure to turn it over to Sarah Corsoso from Eco Canada, and she's going to be actually our presenter for the, the today's webinar. Sarah has a BA from the University of British Columbia, a certificate in HR management from the University of Calgary. She manages ECO's HR and administration department, and she has over 10 years experience working in human resources and recruiting for environmental organizations. So we're very lucky to have her today, and she's gonna walk you through some learning uh, in the next 45 minutes or so. So over to you, Sarah. Awesome, thank you. So thanks everybody um, for joining us today. Um, I'm so pleased to be working with the Project Learning Tree Canada team to bring you this Essential Skills for Job Seekers webinar series. First, I'm gonna introduce to you Eco Canada in case you aren't familiar, um, and just let you know a little bit about who we are and what we do. So Eco's vision is to build the world's leading environmental workforce. We champion the end-to-end -end career of environmental professionals. And the reason why we're here today is because forestry professionals fall under the very large umbrella of the green economy. We do not only train and certify professionals, but we also identify and address labor market gaps. And our efforts are promoting and drive responsible, sustainable economic growth to ensure the environmental care and best practice is a priority. So we're partnering um, with Project Learning Tree Canada to bring you a series of four webinars. And this series of webinars is intended to help you develop the tools and techniques um, that will assist you in performing an effective job search in the green jobs field in Canada. Throughout the webinar series, we'll be covering four topics. So again, today is write your way to the top, how to write an interview worthy cover letter and resume. Uh, in July, we'll be looking at how to set yourself up for success and maximizing and focusing your job search. In August, we'll be looking at the importance of making connections through networking and how to plan and approach your, your networking strategy. And then we conclude at the end of September um, by looking at how you can ace your interview, so the skills and techniques you'll need to help secure the job of your dreams. So I know that preparing for your job search is overwhelming. It's a full-time job, but with the proper preparation, you should be more efficient at locating and navigating the job opportunities. So before we start, I thought we would just sort of touch upon the learning outcomes that we've got for this particular webinar. So we're hoping at the end of today, um, you'll be able to identify what information you need to include in your resume, the structure and the format uh, your resume will need for maximum impact, and then tailoring your resume to help you get past applicant tracking systems, and then the information you need to include in your cover letter. We're also going to provide to you at the end of the session um, some additional resources so that you can start writing or revising your resume right away. So we're going to do a quick icebreaker um, knowledge check before we start just to test your knowledge about the green job market. So we've got a poll here and the question is how long do you think it takes the average university student to find full time employment in a career related job. So you can just answer that we'll take 30 seconds or so. All right, are we ready to show the results here? All right, yeah, so I mean, the majority of you selected the, the correct answer. So three to six months is how long on average it takes um, a university student to find a full-time job within their career-related um, 
studies. So this is just why it's important for you to really focus on your job search and ensure that your resume and cover letter help you stand out from the crowd so that hopefully you're working, you know, in three months as opposed to the six. So I've got some just quick facts here for you um, about why resumes and cover letters are so important. Up to 75% of applicants don't meet all of the requirements of a job posting. So this is either because they're misaligned or they haven't identified them. 80% um, of resumes are rejected in less than 11 seconds. Only about 2% of candidates will actually be selected for an interview. So your resume is really that opportunity to get your best skills and achievements noticed. Again, I know this sounds kind of daunting and scary, but it just really helps illustrate why a well-written resume and cover letter are so important. It's your first opportunity and possibly your only opportunity to show a rec recruiter why you deserve that interview. So I'm just going to uh, spend this one slide talking about the skills. Um, at Eco Canada, we carry out labor market research to look at the different trends in the Canadian green economy. And we've identified the top essential uh, technical skills currently in demand by employers. So this slide just illustrates what those in demand skills are. Things that fall under the, the technical area would be health and safety, um, communication and public awareness, policy and legislation, and adopting sustainability principles. The second group of skills um, that employers are identifying that are needed for success are like the soft skills. So our research is showing that it's common for junior professionals to have limited skills in these areas, um, like writing technical reports, communicating effectively, or collaborating. Um, but they're really important for future success. So both technical and soft skills are important to employers. Um, the technical skills might help you obtain the job, but you have to have both in, in order to really progress in your career. So it's really important to have um, to know your skill set before you start your job search. And so to help you go through this, we we're going to provide a workbook at the end of this webinar um, that you can work through just to sort of identify the, the skills that are relevant for your job search. Okay, so now we're going to start looking at resumes. So we're going to talk um, just briefly about the different types of formats out there. And, um, you know, depending on your work history and experience, one of these formats will work for you. So the first is chronological resumes. So this is where you're listing your work history in reverse. So you're starting with your most recent job um, first. This is the type that's going to allow you the opportunity to showcase your most recent and outstanding um, talents and achievements and also capturing the hiring manager or recruiter's interest right away. Um, they're the, probably the most common used format uh, for good reason. Obviously, employers prefer candidates who have current or very recent experience in their fields. So um, this is a very straightforward way to use um, a format if you've got a, a work experience that doesn't have a lot of gaps and um, it's just the way to go to, to address sort of the, the straightforward application process. If on the other hand, your career history has a lot of job hopping or short term roles or, um, you know, you're transitioning to a different industry, you might want to look at a different format. So we call these um, functional or a combination resume. So a functional resume is focusing on your skills and experience rather than the chronological work history. Again, it's mostly used by people who have gaps in their employment history, or maybe their uh, work experience isn't directly related to the job. So you're really highlighting your specific skills and capabilities, um, as opposed to the, the work, the jobs that you've had. It's less commonly used uh, just because us recruiters out there prefer to see um, the work experience, but I would say um, the trend nowadays and what is the ideal format for a resume is this next one that we're going to look at, which is called a combination resume. So this is offering a mix of the both worlds, um, the best of, of both. So you're looking at the functional and chronological layout. You're focusing first on the skills and then you're following it by your work experience. Um, this is you know, used to show the employer your most relevant skills, qualifications, but also documenting your work history. So in this example, you can, you can see that they've um, 
got both sections for the skills and the work experience. Okay, so now that we've kind of looked at the different formats, I thought we would do just another quick activity. I want you guys to tell me which type of resume you think would work best for each job seeker. So job seeker A has five years uh, of work experience. There's no career gaps, already works in the forestry industry and is looking for a related uh, position in the same field. And then the second job seeker has 10 years of work experience, but she took a sabbatical and traveled the world and is looking to change from a career in administration to one in um, conservation. So just using the chat, why don't you let me know which you think, which resume type, um, so chronological, functional, or a combination would work best for these job seekers. I'll give you about 30 seconds again. Just looking at everybody's responses here. Okay, awesome. Everybody's responding. That's great. So um, there's a lot of the correct answers in there. And, and this is what I would say. So job seeker A has a fairly straightforward work history and is looking to stay in the same field. So in this instance, they would use a chronological resume. Um, job seeker B should probably use a functional or a combination resume because she's got those career gaps and is trying to transition into a new field or sex sector. Um, so she would want to really highlight the key skills that are going to be transferable. All right, so now we're going to um, move on to what you should include in your resume. So as an HR professional, I see a lot of resumes. Um, first impressions are important. So you really want to make sure that your resume is well laid out and to the point. You want to focus on accomplishments and results. And you want to make sure you're capturing the recruiter's attention and not like fluffing it up by using big words or rambling sentences or um, just anything that isn't necessary. So there's no perfect way to do a resume. There's, um, it's very subjective and comes to individual preference, but we've included a template here um, that would be a really great starting point for, for anyone. You're gonna also get a copy of this at the end of the webinar. And there's lots of templates that you can find online or through Word. Um, so, you know, again, it's totally up to you what you choose to use, but this is just a starting point. It's also worth noting that this template isn't gonna work for all applications. Um, particularly the applicant tracking systems because they're finicky around formatting and this one has tables and, and that kind of thing in it. So we will talk about that later, but I just want to stress that it's a good idea to have multiple versions of your resume because you never know um, how you're going to apply or how you want to maybe follow up with um, a prettier looking resume than you do with the applicant tracking system. So um, it's important to have multiple versions. Okay, so this, this next um, slide about what you should include might seem obvious uh, with the contact information. You obviously need to include a way for the recruiter to be able to contact you. Double check it. There have been errors that I've seen in people's contact information before. Sometimes the things that you think you know the best are what you might slip on and make an error. So just um, check that. Another thing is to make sure your email address is suitable for sending to a recruiter. So don't use one that you've been using since high school. Um, it's try to get one that has your name in it. So um, joeblogs at gmail.com is, is our example. Um, and yeah, just ensuring that it's up to date. But um, one thing I've noticed too, like uh, when we receive applications from uh, Calgary, but the person's area code is from Ontario, you might want to just like address that somewhere in a cover letter because it might appear that you aren't actually in the location, maybe you've moved or whatever that may be, but it's just important to keep those little things in mind. Also uh, to include a summary. So um, for anyone who is in a similar age bracket as myself, when I first learned to do a resume, we called them objectives and that is outdated now. So now we're calling it a summary and the summary is meant to be your opportunity to grab and hold someone's attention. So it should be just a few um, sentences that really showcase who you are as a professional and just ex 
summarizes your experience that's relevant to the position that you're applying for. So then you're obviously going to want to include these key skills and you should probably list about six to ten um, that link to the job that you're applying for. So if the job that you're applying for um, you know, you've got the application in front of you, you're going to notice that it says skills and qualifications. That kind of is usually the, the language that's used. So just make sure that your um, the skills that you're listing are relevant to the job that they've identified the skills are, are desirable or essential for them. You're also going to include your education. So you only need to show your highest level of education. You don't need to show um, or include any of the results. For instance, if you graduated from a post-secondary institution, you probably don't need to include that you went to high school. Um, it's implied. You can, if you want, um, include a few bullet points that list your academic achievements. So, um, you know, if you were part of any clubs or awards, scholarships, that kind of thing. Many uh, green careers require technical skills as well. So if you have experience with different software um, or equipment, you know, GIS, uh, materials that you've worked with that you can list here as well. And then for your professional experience, um, again, you'll start with your most recent job and then go backwards from there. You're going to want to make sure that you list uh, the position title and the dates that you worked there. So if you haven't had a job before, um, there are other things that you can use to demonstrate your experience. So the work experience that you've done through your studies, uh, placements or internships that you've had and again just list out the achievements that you've done in that in those positions um, or significant contributions that you've made to the organization. A lot of people also ask me about volunteer um, experience and if it's acceptable to put that on your resume and it certainly can be um, especially in situations where it is completely relevant um, and so it's a way that you can definitely showcase some more skills that you have or show that you're a well-rounded individual. Depending on the company you um, are applying for, this might be something that's very valuable to them. So um, it, it does have its time and place. You can also include activities. So I see a lot of resumes um, for people that list their interests or um, you know, publications, languages that they may have. Again, this is optional. And I just ask, you know, use your best judgment if you think it's really relevant for the particular job that you're applying for. Recently, I'm getting asked about um, how job seekers should address career gaps uh, on their resume. So especially with COVID, um, employment gaps are about to become the new normal. So I always advocate for anyone with an extended gap. So, you know, I'm thinking anything over a year to submit a, an accompanying cover letter or email in order to just explain that concisely to the, the person applying or that you're applying to just because they are probably going to be questioning that anyway. So you're kind of getting ahead of it, but you do not need to go into any personal details at all. Um, you don't need to bring, you know, traumatize yourself any further if there was a situation. It just uh, redundancy due to COVID-19, for instance, would be perfectly acceptable. So now um, we're going to talk a little bit about the, the top resume tips that I have. Um, again, we see a, t a ton of resumes um, as recruiters. And so we don't, well, the slide um, towards the beginning said that, you know, it can be as little as 11 seconds that somebody's looking at your resume. So it's really important that, again, your resume is clear, concise, it highlights your best and most relevant skills. So you're going to want to make sure that you really looked over the job description, you followed any instructions that they um, have listed. I can't tell you how many times I get a, an application on all of the Eco Canada. Uh, jobs, I say that I want to see a cover letter and a resume. And I often, I, it's probably like 90% of people don't include a cover letter, even though it has said that. So just really make sure that you've read it, you know what is required. You can try to limit yourself to two pages. This is like that old school rule that some people have. And depending on who you're talking to, um, they might say, no, use as many as six pages or no, only one page. Um, again, just take a Take a step back and make sure that you're only including information that's relevant. 
So if you can capture it in one page, that's great. If you really need two and a half, that's okay too. It's not gonna ruin your chances if you go a little bit over. You're gonna wanna highlight those you know, impressive achievements at the top so that you get their attention. Um, only have you know, about five or six bullets points for different uh, work or volunteer experience. Focus on the achievements rather than listing all the different tasks and responsibilities. Um, and, you know, don't inflate or lie on your resume because, you know, with reference checks or employment verifications that that does come, the truth does come to light. And then proofread it, proofread it again, have somebody else look at it. Often we get so involved in our own work that we kind of miss the obvious errors. You don't have to include the references available on, re on request. Um, it's not necessary, it, it's implied. You can actually have a separate document and bring that with you to the interview when, it's, uh, when it comes to that time. Also, this is like one of my favorite tips is just to save your resume and cover letter with the appropriate file name. So um, your name underscore resume is perfect. And you don't need to include a photograph. Um, it's not really, required in a lot of North American uh, job postings. Okay, so we've covered uh, a lot of information. Hopefully I'm not going too fast or too slow, um, but I thought we would take another moment to just look at uh, a resume and maybe we can identify some of the areas where this, this individual has gone wrong. So just in the chat box again, we'll take about 30 seconds and just write whatever you see that looks like they um, shouldn't be doing. All right, awesome. So a lot of people are finding um, the same thing. So what I um, singled out would be things like there's not a standard font. They've been using um, different colors. It's just kind of a little flashy. They've included a photo. It's not standard practice. I do see a couple of people in the, the comments there um, sort of saying they do like to include a photo. So we can bring that up towards the end too, if you like. Um, other things are like the email address. Um, they've used the objective rather than the summary. There's some work experience on there that's not super relevant. There's a couple uh, typos in there, like the capitalizations. Uh, the skills aren't really emphasized or listed clearly. They should probably use some bullet points. And uh, they, you don't need to include those references. So hopefully this gives you just like a, a good new way or a keener eye to look at some of the, the resume mistakes or you know things that you might be doing that aren't necessary. Not necessarily mistakes, but just not necessary. Okay, so now we're gonna spend a couple minutes talking um, about applicant tracking systems. And I'm gonna just probably default to saying ATS, um, just because that's easier for me. Um, so often job seekers are submitting online uh, and not getting through the interview process. And they think that this because the review or the recruiter has looked at the resume and rejected it. Um, reality is, is that the majority of resumes never land in the hands of a human. They're automatically stored in those applicant tracking systems, which is a software um, that is used by most, if not all, um, large enough companies uh, to basically quickly determine who has the best fit for the, the position they're hiring. According to JobScan, 99% of Fortune 500 companies um, are filtering resumes through these ATSs. So your resume is going through software before it's reaching a recruiter, if it ever does. But there are some, some tips and steps out there that can help you understand how these systems work and how to get your resume um, seen by an actual human. So, ATSs are a recruiting and hiring tool, and basically they collect 
and um, sort resumes. So we recruiters are looking at hundreds of applications for any one job posting. So to keep them all in one place, it basically helps us um, recruiters and hire managers stay organized. And so there's in theory, saving time by automatically um, surfacing and highlighting the top candidates. In reality, um, they do help narrow down the, the pool of applicants, but top applicants can still slip through the cracks. So again, if you're applying online, um, you're most likely going through an ATS of some kind or another. Um, even job sites like Indeed and LinkedIn have their own built-in ATS. So I, like there's way too many different ATSs out there to comment on like a one size fits all approach, but we'll give you some tips um, that can just sort of help your understanding and, and your resume for making it through the majority of them. Um, so um, knowledge is power and understanding how these work can really help us ensure that our resume actually makes it to people like me, um, recruiters. And so one of the ways that um, they, these systems work is that they use keywords from the job advertisement. So for your application to rank highly and be selected, your resume needs to contain the right keywords. So you basically need to um, echo the exact phrasing from the job description on your resume. So if the position calls for um, geospatial database updates, then your resume must use those exact words. If you list ArcGIS, for example, um, an ATS will not recognize that as it's not the wording that they used, even though it's a type of that software. Um, you don't want to use generic keyword lists that you found online. So um, we've got an example from um, Project Learning Tree's website where they, you know, you would include the title Summer Operations Assistant um, in there because a recruiter is going to type that out and search it. Um, so you would want to include that in your summary, for instance. Another thing is you don't, um, with acronyms, you want to make sure that you're spelling it out and using the shortened one, because again, an ATS is, isn't going to recognize even really common abbreviations. So you just need to be really specific um, to make sure that it makes sense. And then another tip is just um, when you're writing uh, numbers or like a year, you want to write out the entire year. So 2015 instead of um, 15. You're going to also want to focus on hard skills um, for applicant tracking systems because they are primarily looking at those when they're scanning your resume. The soft skills are what's going to be assessed um, later in your cover letter and during the interview. Another tip I have, and this is what a lot of job seekers don't like to hear from me, is that you have to be specific and you have to have a resume for each application um, that you apply for. And I mean every application. Um, you have to adjust your wording so that it matches the exact one you're applying for. You, you don't want to have a generic um, template that goes out. One well-worded, uh, tailored resume is going to yield more results than, than 10 generic ones. And I really, another tip I would have is to save, um, as soon as you see it, the job description that you're applying for, the resume that you use to apply for that job and just save it so that if the recruiter calls you, you can easily find the version that you use. And oftentimes um, the job boards will pull down a position once it's closed and you'll never have that for reference again and you're gonna want to reference back to it obviously. So um, it's really a good practice to save that beforehand. So again, when you upload your resume into an ATS, um, the recruiter won't necessarily view the actual file. So some software takes the information from your resume and loads it into a digital profile just to make things uniform and, and searchable. So this causes a lot of problems. Um, many algorithms that these ATSs are using are outdated um, and they, they can't tell the difference between you know, different formatting. And so a lot of your information can actually get distorted or lost. Um, so this means, again, that those keywords or details that you've worked so hard on um, might not be imported. So it's just really important to, to make sure that it's um, not you know, slipping through the cracks. So some ways to just you know, make sure you're ticking all the boxes would be um, 
don't include information in the header, the systems may not be able to read this information, so it, it might get lost. Don't use fancy templates with tables and images. Again, they just get scrambled. Another gentle uh, reminder to make sure your keywords are matching the, the job that you're applying for so that you um, are ranking highly. And then stay away from fancy fonts. Um, some of these systems don't like it or they don't display properly. So you want to stick with like Arial or Times New Roman. And I've even heard that you should stick with like a size 11 font. Um, again, finally, you want to make sure that you're saving uh, in a compatible format. So usually like a docx or a PDF file. Um, I always prefer PDF myself, but um, you know, having it in multiple different versions is always going to be helpful and cause less frustration down the road. And again, um, the template that we provided or, or we're going to provide, but we showed you earlier, um, is saying that you know you're not just writing a resume for an ATS, but eventually once you're selected, you're going to want to have a resume that looks um, good in a recruiter's hands. So you want to have those keywords, um, but it has to also make sure that you're not just like fluffing up your resume with them. So uh, make sure it's still readable by human, that it looks nice, um, that you're being honest, and uh, you know, if it doesn't genuinely match your education or your experience and skills, don't include it. So this is um, an example of a real life forestry job that was advertised on the um, Project Learning Tree Canada's Green Jobs Board. So another activity, let's try taking just a few minutes and look at this position as if you were applying for it. So scan the description and just pick out the different key qualifications and responsibilities that you think are needed. And we can use the chat um, function again, just to submit those keywords and qualifications, and then we'll see how it compares to, to what I've pulled out. All right, awesome. So there's a lot. Um, you can see some of the information here that I've selected, um, the different types of software requirements, um, experience, languages, education, driver's license. And don't forget that when you're tailoring your resume, you would use the exact terms that they have. Um, so for example, they've written MS Office. So that's what you would use. You wouldn't write out Microsoft Office. So there are a lot of resources available on the internet. Um, to help you uh, guide you through the process and tailing your resume. And sometimes that in and of itself is overwhelming because you don't really know which one you should be uh, listening to. So we've got a tool here that we're just gonna share with you. Um, it's a way to give job seekers like an instant analysis of how well their resume is tailored for a particular job and how you can optimize it to make it even better for an ATS. Um, so the website is just a job scan and then you basically paste in the text of your resume or you can upload um, a Word or PDF file, and then you would paste in the job posting that you're interested in, and it will um, match it. So it gives you basically a breakdown of how well you match the job description in various fields. Um, I think you can access it for free and you get up to five scans a month, but you know, if you're sneaky about it, you could probably have multiple email addresses and get um, more, more scans that way. So I definitely recommend that um, job seekers check this out because it can be a really valuable resource for, for everyone.
Okay, so now that I've talked a whole lot about resumes, we'll just kind of finish up by talking about cover letters. Um, they are a lost art nowadays, but still really important to recruiters. Um, this is something that I talk about a lot within my network is like, are people still expecting them? And most recruiters are gonna say yes. Um, this is where you can really go into detail about why you're looking for a job, what your skills are, or you know, explaining any gaps or things that a recruiter might flag on your resume. So like, you know, job duration, um, reasons for leaving, that kind of thing. So a cover letter is really an opportunity to be more memorable to the recruiter um, by showing your personality or a story. Um, again, it never hurts to have one of these. You're not gonna get penalized for it. So I definitely suggest that it, even if it doesn't ask, you should have something. So what are the things that you should include in a cover letter? Well, you're gonna want to obviously address it if you can to the hiring manager. And so a way to do this is just search out the company. Maybe they have like the about us and you can see who um, it would report to, or uh, you can look on LinkedIn. But if you can't find the name of somebody, you can always just say, you know, dear hiring manager, that's, that's fine. So the first paragraph, generally speaking, you're going to um, just sort of introduce yourself, um, talk about why you want the job. In the second paragraph, you're going to talk about uh, what you have to offer. So, you know, you're summarizing your skills and your experiences. Um, you want to incorporate some of those key words again. The third paragraph, you're going to have some examples of past work or projects that you've um, worked on that really demonstrate those skills that you were mentioning. Um, and then also just use this space to explain why you would be a good fit for the organization. Lastly, you're going to obviously thank the person for their time and consideration and leave your contact information so that they know how to get a hold of you too. Okay, so we're going to have time um, for questions in just a second. But I wanted to highlight some of the resources that we've talked about today and that we're going to share with you after this webinar. So I mentioned the resume and cover letter templates. We've got some tip sheets. Uh, at the very beginning of the webinar today, I referenced the workbook that we'll send out for identifying your skills. We've also got um, some a webinar, a research report that our research team did on the skills essential for success in the environmental sector, and then that link to the job scan um, website. Thanks so much, Sarah. Tons of information. So we're going to go to our, our question and answer. Um, and there are eight questions that we're going to direct your way. Um, people are really interested. So what, the first question that came in was many entry level job postings ask for one to three years of related experience. Do you recommend applying for these jobs, even if you do not meet the experience requirement, perhaps in the hopes that no other applicants do apply? Yeah, for something that's like a one to three year experience and you have closer to the one, like six months or whatever it is, um, I definitely apply. You're still in the running for that. Um, you never know who else has applied, but I would use the opportunity uh, of the cover letter to really like address, like you know that you don't have the exact experience, but here's why you would be the best candidate. And you list some transferable skills, maybe from um, your studies or, another work experience that you have in a different industry, um, that's, that's where you can really demonstrate why you would be a good fit. Great. Um, this person asks, I have a third page on my resume to list my references. Should I not include those? No, you can include that. Um, oftentimes, like as the recruiter, I will print off somebody's like their entire package. And so I, if I was gonna be asking for your references anyways, it's just nice that you've already given it to me. So um, you can definitely include that. Okay, and then the second part of that question was, does submitting a docx versus a PDF affect the ATS in any way? Um, usually they'll tell you that like the preferred method and then also too sometimes they'll, it, it doesn't matter, they'll make you upload it in whatever format you have, but then they also want you to fill out their plain text sort of version. So um, just make sure that you're really reading the instructions because if their system is finicky, they, they will tell you. Thanks. Um, this person says that they often include a picture of my signature on the cover letter. Could this be a problem for ATS? 
yeah, that probably is going to get scrambled because it's an image. So um, I would keep that for the resume that you'll then follow up with. So um, you can apply for a job with just like a very basic text version of your resume and then search out who the hiring manager is or call the, the reception and find out who it is and get their email address and then send them um, your more personalized version. Great. So I just to reiterate, you're suggesting eliminating that signature for the one that you submit online, but then if you can get access to the hiring manager's email, following up with a direct email that includes a more fancy version. Yep. Great. Um, I'm currently in the reclamation industry as an environmental technician in Calgary. I can speak to the importance of tailoring the resume to the job advertisement and looking for keywords. I landed my current job prior to even interviewing because they were so impressed with my related experience and skills. So Brendan just wanted to share that and I, we appreciate that. Um, does it matter to the ATS which pro program I use to design my resume? Uh, word publisher. Is it safe to say that as long as I save and submit the copy as a PDF, it will be processed through the system? Um, I think so. Um, I haven't experienced any issue with the different systems that I've worked with. I personally would keep it to Word um, myself, but um, I haven't heard of that being an issue. So as long as it's in PDF, it should be fine. And I would just follow up that based on what you were saying earlier, if in Publisher you're using that to add graphics or, or charts, avoid that. So if you're using Publisher just as a word processor, then it would be okay, but avoid any of those additional features that you might be using. Yeah. Hello, in the summary section, would you advise to also mention objectives, motivation, or rather to skip it altogether? Um, I think in the summary section, you should really say like why you're the best person for the role and like who you are. So I'm Sarah Casorso. I've got 10 years HR experience um, doing this, this and that. And this is why you should hire me. I don't think you necessarily need to say like, I want to have a full time job working for your company where I can grow my skill set. Like that's, it's, that's not really showcasing who you are. So that's where I would focus on that. Um, selling yourself aspect. Great. Do resumes directly sent to hiring managers emails still go through an, ET an ATS? Uh, sorry, can you read that one again? If you send it directly to um, an email address for a hiring manager, does it, is it likely still going through an ATS? No, it is not. It's going directly to their email. So um, the format that you send it in is the format that they'll see it in. So that's where you can get fancy. Right. Um, so it's really when you're doing those online applications. Yeah. Great. Um, in cases where a current employer is listed on a resume but hasn't been informed, sorry, the questions are jumping all over the place. Um, okay, we'll come back to that question. Um, do you have to match the cover letter exactly to the job description for the ATS? You, you still need to have those keywords in there because you haven't like, these are computers, right? They're finicky. So I would just make sure all the odds are in your favor by having it match as close as you can. Great. Um, it was mentioned to use only your highest level of education, but if your bachelor's degree is slightly different than what your MSc specialized in, should you include both? Sure. Yeah, it, that doesn't hurt. It's just mostly like sometimes I'll see that somebody's got um, they list out their high school and then they've list they list um, their BA, but then they've moved on to a B uh, a C, like that kind of stuff. Is you don't necessarily need to list anything that's not relevant or that's implied. Additionally, where could relevant research projects or publications go on a resume? You could, so instead of that activities section, you potentially could have a different header where it would say that. So something like certifications or publications or something. Yeah. Great. In cases where a current employer is listed on a resume but hasn't been informed that the employee is looking for another job, how should the employee handle being asked to provide a reference for a current position? Yeah, I mean, most, most people in my shoes, we are familiar enough to know that that's going to be a difficult conversation um, or one that you're not comfortable providing. So most of the time I won't ever 
check somebody's reference unless I'm intending to offer them the job. So you're usually, it's, it's sort of safe to say that you're probably gonna be leaving anyways, but um, if you can't get like your direct manager, maybe you can just have a, a colleague or somebody on a different team, um, but just be honest with the recruiter and say, you know, I don't think this is gonna go over very well, so would it be acceptable if I provide you with um, a substitute and just ensure that it's another um, professional working relationship. Great. Do you have to match the code? Oh. Um, what advice do you have for someone changing from the mechanical engineering field to an environmental field? I'm currently completing an honor certificate in environmental engineering, but feel like this may not be enough technical experience to get a job. Do you have any advice for me to learn and find out what other certificates I can get to increase chances? That's a very specific question that I don't think I can answer um, well on the spot, but um, I think probably the upcoming webinars about networking are gonna be um, something that this person would want to attend just because um, a lot of the, there's a lot to be said about the hidden job market um, and, and networking and opening doors through the people that you meet. So, I mean, even some of the Eco Canada networking events that we do would be something I would recommend or taking a look um, just to see what, who, what, um, like if you went on, and search somebody with your dream job, um, see what they've or professional development they've taken and, and look into those opportunities for yourself. Yeah, that's great. And the other thing I would say is um, if you do have this other engineering degree to make sure you're elevating some of the skills that you acquired through that um, field and, and applying that to your resume and either applying that in your summary or in, or in your skills highlights as Sarah talked about. Um, what kind of questions can you, should you ask to the hiring manager? Maybe related to how they want to resume to look, the cover letter information, et cetera. So, so asking the hiring manager how they would like to receive the resume, is that what that's Yeah, asking? I think it's, if, they, if you contact the hiring manager directly, what types of questions are you able to ask to, to elevate your opportunity or success of getting your resume through? I think just doing that in and of itself is getting the person's attention because they're now going to expect it. Um, so you're already kind of putting yourself on the top of that pile by showing some initiative by um, trying to figure out how to impress this person. So it's fine to say like, hey, I, I saw this job um, advertised on your website. I've been wanting to work for this your company forever. Um, can I send you my resume directly and then just send it in a, a PDF? I think that would that would be great. I have been told that if you don't know the hiring manager to avoid saying dear hiring manager and instead leave it blank, do you think leaving it blank would be seen more as a negative? Yeah, you need to have it addressed to somebody. So um, I don't, I don't think it really like if you don't know, and if the, the company hasn't made it obvious who's reviewing it, you're not going to be put at fault for putting dear hiring manager or, or dear human resources or whatever that looks like, you're not going to be penalized for that. Um, I think leaving it blank is probably worse in my, in my opinion. I've heard that too. And I've also heard to whom it may concern is really negative as well to stick to hiring manager. Um, would you recommend adding something to your resume to make it pop, i.e. some color in the header or something simple? I've heard conflicting advice about this. I think like I, I've thought about this a lot when we're preparing for this um, webinar and I think you know it's always impressive when somebody has this like really artistic resume but I'm also equally impressed by somebody who can just put the information in a nice layout and it's simple and it's to the point so um, I think you just want a really well well laid out resume and if um, you know, the job you're applying for requires some creativity. That's a great way to showcase it. But if it doesn't, um, you know, it's not necessary. And does that color affect your resume going through ATS? Like, is that something you would only use if you're doing it direct to email? Yeah, that's, that's, um, I wouldn't do anything fancy whatsoever with an ATS because you just never know. 
but when you're sending it to an email address or you're like actually dropping it off in front of somebody, then you could use color if you wanted, just as long as it's still professional, right? Okay, and on the same lines, I think this person has asked one of the resume examples you showed, um, it looks like a skill stat bar on the side column. Is that a format you'd recommend? Yeah, the, like the format that we, or the template that we've provided is, is a really easy template to work with. And, and I see a lot of resumes that come in looking like that. And that's probably the one I would use. So um, yeah, I think that's fine. But again, not if you're applying through ATS. Only use that format if you're applying directly to email, correct? Yeah, and like a lot of ATSs too, are you're just gonna copy and paste your stuff into um, as well. Like sometimes you're not even, sub, or you're not uploading a document. So you just wanna make sure that you're not putting in all your eggs into making this like fantastic resume. You also have just like a text version or you're prepared to hand something in that doesn't have the, the five hours of work that you put into the, the images and tables and, and that kind of thing. Great. Um, thanks for the information. I have a question about the gap. Since I graduated from university till now, I graduated in 2014. And since then, I've been looking for jobs with no success. Um, and although I've been working in restaurants. So what would you recommend I put on my resume? You can just put that right. Um, you can say like, you haven't had success for a job in your field. Um, but you've been working in the restaurant industry, these are the skills that you've got from that and why they're transferable. And there's a ton of transferable skills, like soft skills from restaurant or retail work. Um, I've got seven years of retail experience that is totally transferable to the job that I do now. Um, so just make sure that you're using probably the cover letter to kind of demonstrate that or things that you've um, done throughout that employment gap uh, where you've stayed in in the know about um, the industry you want to be in. So you've taken some courses or you've gone to networking events. That's that's key there. Okay. Unfortunately, folks, we're not going to get through all questions because there are still 22 questions that are, are out here. Um, so I, I'm going to answer a few more, but then I'm going to recommend that um, if you have any specific questions to email myself or Sarah directly and we'll share the contact. Um, but we will answer a couple more here. Uh, and I do apologize. Uh, I'm a would you recommend to refer into the cover letter the job requirements, for example, willingness to travel or is it implied that by the applying for the job that I'm ready to do it? No, I would say in there that you are. Yeah, because there's so many times that people are not reading the job descriptions and I have to ask them and they, you know, they've said, oh, wait, no, never mind. So if you just reiterate it, that, that's good. Um, what is the best way to get experience in this industry if you have no work experience? So that's just, again, networking, um, seeing what other people who are working in the industry are doing in terms of courses or certifications, um, that kind of thing. Just throw yourself into the conversations that are happening and, and making relationships is what I would be doing. Um, I'm about to finish my PhD, but I have no work experience in the industry, only with research. However, entry positions always ask for some experience. How do I address this issue? Um, well, I think there's there's always going to be some sort of transferable skill that if if you've been um, you know working with a team or you've done some project work, um, there's a way to um, say that you know I may not have exactly this experience that you're looking for, but here's what I do have, and that's you know just your ability to articulate that and to sort of self reflect and see where the linkages may be is a good way to demonstrate that you would be a good fit for for the role. And would you suggest to this type of a participant that they flip their experience in education? So elevate that education and highlight some of the project work? Yeah, you could do that. Um, sometimes people I've heard, um, you know, like they have some credentials that maybe make them look overqualified, but they don't necessarily have the experience yet. And so sometimes you might want to remove anything that is going to limit you from that initial um, scan of your resume and then you can bring it up later, right? Like I wouldn't, I've had lots of people do that. Like, oh, I didn't list that I actually have a PNG because, you know, wasn't needed for this role, but I do have that and here's why it's transferable. Okay. 
Regarding green jobs, are international students qualified for them? If so, are there still positions available this summer? Um, I think you were referring to the PLT Canada green jobs. And as long as you are um, a Canadian citizen or you have um, status to work and, and study in Canada, then you are eligible. Um, and there are positions available, so check out our job board. Um, okay, so I'm going to hold on and I, I will answer some of these questions to the best of our ability in typing form so that they will be available in the, the recording moving forward. But I am going to move on to our final slides uh, just to, to make sure that we end on time. So again, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to reach out. Uh, I'm just looking at the slide now and realizing that our email addresses are not here. So I'm going to include those in the chat right now. And we would be happy to help you with any of your resume questions. We can reach out to Sarah as well. Um, and if you have any questions about PLT Canada, we'd also love to address those. And just a reminder that this is the first in a series of four. And so our next webinar, which is on um, maximizing your online job search is on July 30th and all of them are at the same time. Um, if you attend all four webinars, you will receive a certificate or certificate joint between PLT Canada and Eco Canada, just stating that you have this essential skills for job seekers. So again, some of you were asking, how do I demonstrate what I've been doing to develop experience and develop knowledge? Having certificates like this is a great thing to, to have on that resume. Um, so please join us for all that you can. Uh, if you would like to register, it's on pltcanada.org. And I do thank Sarah for all of her information. And Sarah, if you have any final remarks, uh, I'll let you have the last word. <laughs> uh, no, I don't think I have anything. I'd be happy to address anybody's uh, questions that they have afterwards. So um, I'll send um, my email address, I guess, to you and you can circulate it with the resources. Sarah, or you can just put it in the chat if you would like to do that. Great, so thanks everyone for joining us and I hope you were able to take some, some key learnings away from here. It sounds like lots of your questions were around using the ATS, which is really exciting because we felt like that was something that many people were looking for more information on. Um, and I really love that Sarah was able to emphasize the, the use of keywords and the importance of having a unique resume and cover letter for the positions that you're applying for and increasing your opportunity to actually get the job you're seeking. So again, please reach out to us if you have any more questions and look for those follow-up documents that we will be sending to you. Um, some of those uh, checklists, templates, uh, as well as the, the keyword um, worksheet. So thanks so much for joining us and we look forward to seeing you uh, next month. Great, thank you.